Let's welcome Dr. Brenda Fry for her talk. Okay, hello, and it, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Um, so, I, as you probably know from last night, I am Brenda Fry, a professor of astronomy at the University of Arizona, where I've been for a long time now. I'm also a mother of three children, all teenagers right now. <laughs> it's, it's quite humbling if, you, if you've been there. <laughs> um, and I'm also Jewish. So I just wanted to, wanted to let you know that. So I come with a different perspective, and Father Southway say, "Oh, we really still, we really want you to come and give your opinion as well." So, um, so I'd love to talk about what I call more faith in astronomy, um, um, which is my expertise, astronomy, and mainly science. You know, um, um, although I'm Jewish, I'm not uh, a theologian, right? Um, and so. What I say is just one opinion. There is a comment that, you know, if, if we would get 100 Jews in a room and ask a question, we'd get 101 different answers. <laughs> okay, okay. So, <laughs> so please keep that in mind. And what I'll talk about, um, I'm trying to lean towards what I think might be the consensus view amongst, um, in contemporary Judaism, amongst religious Jews. Um, in particular, and I did interview the Orthodox rabbi in Tucson, um, Rabbi Shemtov, uh, to get some of the material today. Um, although any limits in my understanding are not owing to him, but probably in my lack of reading those references properly or something. But I hope you'll enjoy. Um, I did want also to echo uh, Dr. Graney's idea that he posed earlier today, that in his research he did not doesn't seem to find really any obstacles between faith and science in that connection. And I think he went on to say that even historically, he doesn't see that there's a really, just, at least there's not a really good precedence for there being any significant obstacles between faith and science in the connection. And in my interviews and in my reading, um, I find that the same is happening on the Jewish side. So. Maybe we'll have a, a green light to help, you know, continue these discussions into the future. And not only that, but it might even be, I mean, I first got this idea from Brother Guy, and he encouraged me to think on this topic. And I think, you know, it might even be rather fundamental um, in our future, and we might be able to get to this topic a bit towards the end. We'll see. Um, just personally, how I've always sort of thought of it, just as we get started here, is to say, okay, if you really want to obtain complete knowledge, even in astronomy, or to see where a galaxy came from, where the universe came from, get really big, where you came from, then uh, you need this much knowledge. Wow, that's a lot of knowledge, okay. And by doing science, as we know it, the way we've laid out modern science, we get kind of part way, depending, maybe it's here, maybe it's there, <laughs> maybe it's there, but it's not the full amount there's something missing. We're able to say very well how the sun works, how the sun generates energy, how the earth can absorb that energy, how plants can make use of that sunlight to produce oxygen for us to breathe, how those stars can assemble into a galaxy like our own Milky Way, a magnificent spiral galaxy, and how those galaxies can move with respect to other galaxies, and how our Milky Way really started out very small, actually and it got bigger and bigger over time. We start to piece those things together. But we don't know why. <laughs> we don't know why. We describe mainly how processes work. So I think to get the how and the why very quite possibly requires faith and science to come together at some point. There could even be a crisis at some point in the future in which we'll be required to get there. So it's the good that we're thinking about it now, and we can talk more about that. Okay, so my talk will have three parts. Um, I wanted um, this to be broken down into, into potentially really commonly discussed ideas in the Jewish community, but ones you know, that may, may, you know, they're not going to be unusual to you all, but I know I'm kind of um, out of my league in this crowd, so, <laughs> so um, hopefully this will, this will be a good start. And uh, the, the first two um, 
thinkers are Rabbi Maimonides and Rabbi Rashi, who possibly some religious in the room or some of the other you may have heard of them. I would say if you ask any Jewish person, they're probably the two most famous ancient great sages. Maimonides lived about 800 years ago and Rabbi Rashi about 900 years ago. And we still, you know, every week we go to synagogue, we still very much uh, depend on their commentary. They also were really quite responsible for writing down much of the um, or oral traditions and um, ideas that were passed down generation by generation orally that are still considered part of, um, of our important sacred texts. Uh, so I'll start with um, an idea from Rabbi Maimonides who was also a really, really important figure because he lived 800 years ago at a time when there was a crisis between faith and science. Actually, a very similar crisis. It was a time when, when there was a lot of scientific ideas out there. One was already able to predict accurately when eclipses would happen, for example, so there's a pretty good understanding even of calendar and our sun-earth-moon system at the time but also a real problem with faith, so he actually wrote a book on helping the perplexed, you know, on that topic. He also took on the monumental task of going through the first five books of the Bible and writing down every single point in order that we should follow, because Jews say there are 613 commandments to follow. <laughs> and the very first one was to set up a calendar. So he played a big role in making sure that calendar was set up and it was very important that um, that calendar is accurate and it was measured by the lunar cycle. So it's important also that we mark the very beginning of each month quickly and as accurately as possible each time set up a lunar calendar. As we learned um, from Brother Guy and, and others, calendars have all kinds of problems through history, but, uh, but that was what he identified as the first commandment to Jews, so calendar is very important to us, and um, the moon as well. Okay, um, Rabbi Maimonides, he's also, he was a, a scientist, a theologian rabbi. He was also a great physician. He worked um, um, for the Sultan um, as a personal physician. He was also, he was recruited by King of England as well, but declined, and he interacted a lot with scientists in the Middle East, actually, with um, secular people and with Muslim scholars, so he really came together and tried to put together the best ideas that he could. So let's move along a little bit then and start there. Okay, so yeah, this starts out with Maimonides' idea that, you know, he wrote this book, Guide to the Perplexed, to try to help bridge faith and science. And he also, um, the most important thing is he derived um, some really interesting point that I think is relevant to faith and astronomy today, which is that we should be in awe of God. And this doesn't mean that we just say, say whatever we say, once a week in church or in synagogue, but that we should literally be fully in, in awe of God. And how can that happen? Well, I don't know if you could just will it to happen, but um, one has to, in a sense, his idea was is to awaken a love of God inside of you, awaken that love of God. And to awaken it, then you need to observe his creation. He came on to essentially say that he thinks that going to beautiful places or having beautiful places that every human has access to is sort of a part of inspiring that awe. He would probably be a big proponent of national parks today and, and things like that, which are kind of established in some ways for the similar reasons and the reasons why we fight not to have, you know, the Grand Canyon paved, you know, or something like that, you know. But that's one of those places, right? But I did want to also get your opinion. That's why I'm here, as I'm, I'm so delighted to travel and to get, to get everyone's opinion here. So which experiences give you all that, that feeling? I'm curious to know. Yeah, yeah. I just have one, and I'm sorry to embarrass this person of our group, but the person who shared with me that when we looked at the solar prominences through my little telescope, 
It was the first time you've ever looked through a telescope. Who was that? Oh. Yeah. And nice. Dr. Brenda, would you repeat that for the people on streaming? They can't. Oh, sure, yes. Yeah. So this is Father Kaczynski who was pointing out that he has a telescope set up in the parking lot here, um, and it has a H alpha filter, so you can look directly at the sun through this filter and see st storms on the sun called solar prominences. And there's a member of, of this group who said that uh, she looked through a telescope for the first time and saw these very special solar prominences for the first time. That's a good and example. I, and at the risk of putting an experience in you that I felt <laughs> your awe and it sparked joy on me. Aww. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really nice thought. Yeah, and yeah, I'd love to get, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, so this is another um, thing that could strike on people is, is looking at a newborn baby. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we go up here from uh, a small detour to a town in Indiana called Vernon, which has a river going cut deep through it that the banks are full of Virginia bluebells, which are now in full bloom. Uh -huh. Plus other stuff. So it's this massive, odd, just, just sort of you walk along, along, along of uh, spring wildflowers just exploding into bloom everywhere. Right, right. So for those who, who are streaming in, this was just a, um, the, the beautiful sight that, um, of essentially sort of river banks of spring flowers um, for Virginia bluebells and others. Yeah. That's right. I noticed the pink ones too were striking to me. I forget the name Sheila told me, but that's it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so probably my biggest moment is uh, if you've ever been caught in a lightning storm in like the plains of Indiana or any plains, the lightning does things there that just is the most breathtaking thing in my life. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, this comment was just a, a witnessing a lightning storm and really inspire awe. Yeah, we've got good ones in Tucson too. <laughs> yes. I'll share one more and I promise I won't dominate, but because I've had a lot of awe filled moments in my life. Um, I'll never forget when I decided, when in my, my, la my second last year of seminary, when I made the decision that, yep, I'm going to be a priest, I want to tell my grandmother because. You know, she was one of my biggest supporters. And my grandmother was a very non-emotional, tough German, and I would never see her cry. And she just started to weep, and there was just kind of that moment of awe of her joy of my vocation and affirming of mine, so. Yeah. Wow, this is another comment by um, Father Kaczynski saying when he uh, made the commitment uh, to become a priest, that he let a very important family figure know his grandmother, um, who he saw essentially cry for the for the first time, probably yeah, and 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 um, showing that her awe and her affirmation also of his his choice, yeah. Yeah. Flowers. I'm so I'm so <coughs> amazed at flowers and variety, the, the way they grow. Um, I learned about values last summer, and they're just the most amazing cars. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they just, you can't, you can't, you cannot think of values in the Mm -hmm. This was a, a nice comment about flowers, the variety of flowers and the way they, they grow, um, but it strikes awe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Heights, so any mountain top, anything with a big panorama, sometimes it's referred to as the metaphysician's view. <laughs> yeah, this was a really nice comment about uh, mountain tops, just the, the the grand vistas that one sees from mountain tops. Yeah, yeah. Standing before the Niagara Falls, taking in the experience. Standing before the Niagara Falls. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Another very inspiring sight. Standing in front of Niagara Falls, and feeling that that grand, powerful waterfall right in front of you. Yeah. 
Monarch butterflies. Oh, the migration of the monarch butterflies. I agree. Did you see them? Oh, and in, in Mexico. Yes, I'm going to say where along their track because it's a long one. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all of the images from the Hubble and Webb telescope. Oh, thank you. I I, I planted this person. <laughs> So, so the, the comment was that one is in awe of the Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb Space Telescope images. Yeah, things. Yeah. Um, when there's vocal prayer, um, a lot of people together where you can hear other people praying the same thing you're praying at the same time. I find that awesome. Thank you. Yeah, here's another idea of vocal prayer in groups where groups of people can say the same prayer at the same time in unison. I planted that person too because we hope, we hope to say a new moon prayer later on today as a big group. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, indeed, yeah. So I think you probably get the idea since I'm sort of subtitling this uh, really faith in astronomy, which is, to my mind, how I feel it is that science gives me a route to appreciate nature. And by doing science, I can appreciate nature in much, with much more focus and much more detail than just by looking at it. I contribute every day. I, I, study, I study nature in this way, right? Um, and um, that gives me a sense of awe. And in turn, I think it feeds back into strengthening our faith in various ways, right? Uh, I heard a few comments in the audience as well, you know, how can there not be a god when you see these things that put you into awe. And, um, you know, so there's another thought too, really, the more one recognizes this vastness of creation, whether the vastness is in space or from a mountaintop or within the details, the geometry of a flower, um, then, the, then um, the greater is the perspective on the infinite greatness of God. That is the notion. Maimonides did many things, but this, but this is the one I'm going to concentrate on, and I might leave that with this example here, this image. This one I'll start out with the Hubble Space Telescope and finish with one from the James Webb Space Telescope of this star field, where um, you can see with the great sort of spatial resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope how, how, how beautiful and colored and varied are all the stars in our galaxy. These are stars in our own galaxy. And when we see something that truly puts us, oops, into awe, then our talk disappears. So, <laughs> so let me... <laughs> I think that happened to Dr. Cookie, too, so maybe, um, maybe we'll get it back. I find Murphy's Law very awful. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That um, we, we actually say a prayer called a little bracha when we see something that puts us into awe. And it goes, Baruch Ata Hashem Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shekacha Lo Be'olamo, which means we praise you, eternal God, sovereign of the universe, that such as these are in your world. Okay, good. I suppose just before I get to here, if you allow me, I'm going to now move into this topic of eclipses, but first I wanted to move more gently into the area of the moon and the sun. And I think from Dr. Graney's talk, I think it was Dr. Graney's talk we heard about what happened on the fourth day, that two great luminaries, fourth day of creation, two great luminaries um, presented to the universe and they were the sun and the moon. But what we learn in going to the Talmud, um, some Jewish texts that recorded some ancient oral histories is that there was a, a kind of a debate going on. You, well, you know, of course, on the fourth day, were there any people? No. So you'd think God was um, happy there are no complaints from anyone. <laughs> but um, actually, apparently, that wasn't quite true. So the story that we tell is that the moon wanted a word with God. God said, okay. And the moon said, so, as I understand it, you know, we, you created two great firmaments, you know, the heaven and the earth. And the heaven is much, much better than the earth. And he said, yeah, okay, right. And, you know, you created fire and water. Um, 
but the water is actually much greater than the fire. The fire's bright, but then the water can cover it up and smother it. So actually, the water is much more powerful. Yeah, okay, right. But, but you know, you created two equal luminaries. And by the end of that verse in Genesis, we see that two great luminaries are created, but one ends up above the other. So how did that work out? So the moon complains and says, well, tell me this, okay. Can you have two kings in the same kingdom? No, of course not, yeah. So what are you gonna do about that? You know, I'm not, I'm not happy that there's two great luminaries. So um, God said, yeah, okay, then moon, you go and diminish yourself. <laughs> you go and diminish yourself then. That's how you're gonna say it. But, you know, we can let you um, be present in the sky in the day and the night, but you diminish yourself. You know, so we, we carried that through, but realize, of course, that maybe it's not just aimed at only the moon, but perhaps a bit aimed at ourselves, and a reminder not to get too arrogant with wherever we are, that if we can learn to apply a little bit of humility, then maybe it will help us in the end to better appreciate who we are and how we interact with people. But I thought I might add that to the story of these two great luminaries. Okay, the next topic is, are eclipses good or bad? This is something else that's been discussed and had to be properly digested also in, in Jewish thought. Because, or yeah, I talked about the two luminaries. Because eclipses, as we all know, and we even know from our little folders we got, were historically bad. It's not considered a very good thing when the you know, sun gets taken away from you, right? So you can imagine that would not have been quite so pleasant. And um, they're historically considered uh, mazel ra in Hebrew, which is essentially a bad luck, bad constellation, um, a bad day. And so it's from Rashi that, that um, you know, he pointed out that eclipses can be seen as punishments for certain transgressions. There's kind of a list of them. One at the very top is not providing a proper eulogy for a religious leader. So be very careful about that, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Respect your religious leaders, of course. Um, but then, of course, you know, um, so, you know, it, this interpretation that maybe an eclipse means, means that it, the expression, visual, visual expression of God's unhappiness, we did something wrong, and so then there's an eclipse. But then, of course, as a brother guy pointed out as well on the first day, this is really at odds with our understanding, you know, because we know that you can predict eclipses in advance. You can predict them centuries in advance, for sure. So whether you were bad or good that week, doesn't matter, it's gonna be the eclipse. You know, <laughs> so it <laughs> helps you a little bit. Um, eclipse will just come either way. But there's a twist on that as well, the plot thickens, because it turns out that in the time in which even Rashi's interpretation was made, um, one could already predict eclipses. Science was already advanced to that level. So they already knew that and had that idea in their wheelhouse. So now this, again, it doesn't really help us to understand this passage. So the interpretation we're asked to think about is um, maybe it's not really the contradiction, but rather a way for you know, science and the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, to work together. And the idea is that, in Jewish thought, is that there can be some days that can be predisposed to bad luck, mazel ra. And the eclipses might be examples of those days. Didn't want to put a damper on your eclipse. But <laughs> um, so what should you do? Should you hide in a closet then on that day? I bring that up because I had the passenger with me on the airplane, total stranger, told me a story about how she was attending school in rural Illinois. I don't know where, but somewhere. And there was an eclipse, and her teacher was telling her she'd go blind for sure 
she didn't look through the glasses, not, you do need to look through your glasses, but she was so frightened she faked a fever and stayed home and hid in the closet and missed it. Um, so I tried to encourage her to see it this time, and there's a healthy way to see the eclipse. Um, so that is one option, right, hide in the closet, but again, we're, we're told that there's a lesson that comes from this. There's a lesson that comes from this, which is not to go about, that instead of being, you know, just hiding, that one can instead use this opportunity to be mindful of that day, to be mindful on your actions on certain days. And this is the type of day where, where if there's a predisposition towards bad luck, to be especially mindful, to be good, to rise up above that, and to make it a day that's different from other days, in that positive sense. Okay, good. Um, yeah, and there are also cycles of the moon, of course. So in particular, lunar cycles, as I pointed out, um, one of the most important first things to do, um, you know, many centuries ago was to build a calendar, and we built the calendar based on the lunar cycle, and it was very important to note the beginning of each new moon. I think as Father Sapi points out, you know, he, he recalls reading stories about how you'd have to find the moon, there'd have to be three witnesses of that new moon, you can't just make it up, or the three of you could make it up, I guess, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and then he would say, you know, you'd light a fire and send smoke signals to the next place, the next place, until it gets, um, you know, until, until word gets around that the new month has started, okay? And then there would be a special prayer that gets attached to it as well, and I think there's a, some comment made on this side of the room about the um, group prayer, bringing people in awe, and this is one prayer that's meant to be said in a group. It's basically um, Psalm 148 and, um, and a couple of other lines, and during that psalm, you are physically supposed to jump in the air towards the moon. And, uh, you know, it's meant to be read, read in groups, so um, this would be a nice event. It's a really, it's a celebratory event, it's a festive time, and you're meant also to um, dress up nicely for this prayer and this event. So at one point, in fact, you're supposed to jump up and you say, just as I leap towards you, towards the moon, and cannot touch you, so may none of my enemies be able to touch me for evil. Yeah, it has a nice ring to it. But then, in July of 1969, what happened? <laughs> We landed on the moon. <laughs> it's a small, you know, but, but you can see how that could become a little crisis of faith for some, and they would say, um, so now this means our enemies can touch us <laughs> or evil or, or what, you know. And there was actually, you know, a little bit of concern there. So the question was how to, how to, you know, interpret that. We needed that understanding. And you know, there was some back and forth, and uh, I'm not privy to all the details. But the, the basic, you know, response in the end was, yeah, a person jumping up from Earth cannot reach the moon, okay? Um, with, you know, a lot of effort, you can send someone to the moon, but that's very different from someone jumping up and reaching the moon. And another response from a different rabbi as well um, is, well, you see, even like a five-year-old <laughs> would understand this imagery, <laughs> you know? So it's, um, it's okay. It doesn't interrupt um, the, the following the commandments. That doesn't interrupt that process at all, and it's some, something slightly different. So um, I'm not sure, yeah. But, but um, the idea also is that putting actions into the prayer it's joyful, it goes into the spirit of celebrating the festivity, it's a, it, you remember it a little more perhaps, especially if you're that five-year-old and uh, you're otherwise finding some prayer service boring when you're five or something. So, so it was considered a joyful act and now everyone is you know, okay with that. So I'm glad. Okay. Um, and the third topic is, uh, what does it mean to place limits on God? This is um, obviously not a new notion, but there are some takes on it that are considered to be Jewish, so I thought I'd bring it up as well. Um, so, 
yeah, we can do science, and as I pointed out, we, um, the understanding, as I, ha I understand it, is the same as Dr. Graney's, that there's no real obstacle to faith in science. So we can do science, we can question the results, um, but are there limits? Is there science you shouldn't do? You know? And I, I, again, I usually you know, use the application of astronomy because that, that's what I know. So there are a couple of different examples there. One example that's used quite a lot in modern texts is what if we search for life on the moon, or we search for life on Mars, or we search for life on Europa, this moon of Jupiter that Brother Guy showed uh, last night, and we don't find it? Then what? Then what can we say? We didn't look hard enough. That's, that's, that's really, thank you. I, I did want participation. Yeah, that's right. That's one thing you could say. What else could we say? Keep looking. Keep looking. Thank you. Yeah, I planted that guy too. And, <laughs> and, and what else can we say? It isn't there. It isn't there. Thank you. Yeah, and maybe it's God's way of showing us how unique we are. Maybe it's God's way of showing us how unique we are. Right. I think all of these are really valid points. And the point made by um, this is by what's considered probably probably by Jews to be the greatest modern sage, right? The um, Lubavitcher rabbi, Rabbi um, Schneerson, is that. Um, well, it goes right along with the, with the guy's idea. But the point is that we can't put limits on God. We don't know why we didn't find life. It could be for any of the reasons given. So maybe we can try again, or search elsewhere, or keep searching, but we can't pretend that it means that there's no life, that we put limits on God's power. We don't know. We can't know the... The answer to that, we keep looking and looking and looking, and maybe we'll find it one day. But we can't look in one or two places and then say, oh, there's no life outside of Earth. Maybe there's not. But we don't know, and we can't presume to put limits on God that way. That was kind of the last main thought. So I'll show this picture again and come back to another idea. Um, but it I think is prevalent because it was said by this great modern sage, Rabbi Schneerson, that science in itself is neutral, neither good nor evil. One is obligated to elevate the entire creation and make it serve a sacred purpose. This includes science, with which if objectively understood, can help to strengthen faith. And I think we saw that already in everything from the little flowers to the great vistas to the pictures of astronomy. And because I promised you one picture from the James Webb Space Telescope, although I'll show you all the more pretty pictures tomorrow, here is the one I'll, I'll leave you with, the latest one from the James Webb Space Telescope along with um, another quote from Maimonides to end it. In all your ways, know him. Thanks. Thank you, Doctor. Um, my mind's always going. I think if ever I was going to write a science fiction book, um, it'll be at, a, at the particular moment when they find out after exploring all of this, that there is no life, that we're alone. Um, how, many of you, how many of you read Canticle for Leibowitz? If you haven't read it, you need to read it, okay? Um, how many of you have seen the movie Don't Look Up? Talk, we can talk later, okay. <laughs> Um, speaking of movies, we do have, uh, the movie was the option in case we couldn't see, okay? But it looks like we're going to have some telescopes out tonight. So, um, if you want, I'll have the movies in the annex. If you want to go and watch one of the movies, I'll have it there. I have one also called Sky Glow. Uh, Brother um, Fra Roderick has it in there. I'll take it out. That's another Kickstarter 
um, thing that I supported. And they spent like two years doing uh, uh, time, uh, um, time um, eclipse, not, not eclipse, but time el elapse, okay, photography. And of all kinds of Milky Way coming up and down and over this, over that, and it's just, it really is impressive. Um, but it's called Sky Glow. And I, I got the book. I think the book is in the annex, so you can just look through that too. I'd rather not sell that one. There are other books down there. There's also a cookbook from our parish, so uh, that's available for $25 or $20. Oh, $20, okay? So I told the ladies I'll try. So okay. <laughs> make me proud, okay? <laughs> no. um, so, but otherwise, we're free until 5.45. Uh, the annex and the bookstore, I believe, are open. So we'll see you back at 5.45. Uh, sorry. May I ask Dr. Yeah, Dr. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. All right, yeah. yeah, I'd love to take questions. Yeah, if it's okay. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Faith uh, in should support faith. We look at it with awe, but so many in the hard sciences are atheists. And I, I recall seeing, uh, maybe you've seen Ben Stein's movie, um, Expelled No Intelligence Allowed, and he interviewed many in the hard sciences at you know at top universities and if you even uh, wrote a, a comment about the possibility of intelligent design you were expelled from the from the academy you know, uh, why is that do you think and what can we do to help young people who are going into the sciences from losing their faith because I, I think it's their in the process of, of studying, you know, physics, biology, for losing their faith. Uh, what, what would you say? Well, I could say a couple of things, and then I really want to defer to experts in the room um, to answer this question, who have thought about this far more than, than I have. Um, but I do work with undergraduates all the time, doing teaching, research, and service at the university. So, I mean, I can at least say it seems to me like there's some confusion, um, probably, that has something to do with it, a confusion in which some people think, oh, well, you know, we want to know how the sun shines and so on. And, and um, you can't just say, um, it's cheating to say, God wills it. And, well, okay, well, you know, there's, there's a part of that, I mean, to break this down, I mean, why we have stars in the universe, why we have life in the universe is at this point beyond science. So I would say we, we need faith to help us on that aspect. But how the sun works, sure, we know about nuclear fusion. Right? So the how is much easier to answer with science and not, we don't know the why, but we can put together some hows. How, how plants absorb sunlight you know, by their chlorophyll and produce oxygen. You know, we, we can get the hows right. We don't know why life started on Earth, right? That's a faith thing. So I think people are confused. They think that, that we're going to try to cheat and just say, because God wills it. And then they think they have to remove God from the equation completely to understand. So I think there's a bit of confusion there. Because I don't see that you have to remove. Um, but I don't have the good... Um, I, I don't think about this all the time, but I'd love if it's okay with people like Brother Guy to say something. Yeah. One of the things that I noticed in your description was something that you had seen in media. If you think of who are the religious people that you're most likely to see, on popular media, and then compare them to the religious people you actually know, there's a terrible disconnect. And the same is true of scientists. The scientists you're most likely to see on you know, the internet, on YouTube, are not typical of scientists. Um, there has, first of all, been a real change in the last 30 or 40 years in the way that people in science t 
talk about people who are religious. I think of George Coyne, my predecessor in many ways, and you know, 20 years older than me. And I think he fought that kind of fight. I think he won. When I became a Jesuit, I'd been a scientist for 20 years, and I was afraid, what are my friends going to think? And the shock was how almost all of them would say, you're religious? Were you always religious? Sure couldn't show it, you know, with, beside that. <laughs> <clears throat> but then they'd say, let me tell you about the church I go to. And I discovered among scientists, it's as common to go to a church as it is from whatever background you come from. Uh, you know, among British males, it's not very common because religion has a terrible time in England right now. Here in Chicago, it's not at all uncommon. And what is actually more likely to happen, which I'm not sure is a complete improvement, is, oh, I've got a friend who's a Muslim, and I've got a friend who's a Jew, and I've got a friend who's a, a, a Mormon. And it's like you're checking them off like there are sports teams that they rooted for, <laughs> rather than actually taking seriously what they're saying. But my reaction to the people, first of all, I know very, very few scientists who would claim to be atheists. I know a lot who will say they're agnostic. And there's a really important difference. Uh, Carl Sagan, usually thought of as a typical atheist scientist of you know, George Coyne's generation, but he actually said, no, no, an atheist is somebody who knows more than I do. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, another public scientist, um, will go out of his way to say nice things about Jesuits. I think, in part, because he's a buddy of mine. And I think part of the way we get through that is by being friends with the people of, of the different varieties. But if you ask somebody why they don't believe in God, it's often because the picture they have of that God is so awful that they're absolutely right not to believe in that God. I don't believe in that God either. You know, I only believe in one God. There's a whole lot of gods I don't believe in. And especially, I think, for someone, you know, in their teens and 20s who are announcing to you that they've become atheists, I wouldn't worry about it that much if they're still good people. Because... God's still with them. They're still looking. I, in one of the, uh, the books that uh, you can't find anymore that I wrote, I did an interview of you know, religious people and who are scientists and engineers, and they're really, really easy to find. And typically, your typical nerd, when they get to college, stops going to church, but they still have the questions that are religious questions, they're still looking. But they've, they found that their childhood religion isn't sufficient anymore, and they're right. It's part of growing into a deeper religion. And usually by the time they're 40 and they have a family, they're going back to church, usually the wife's church, I'm not quite sure why, <laughs> regardless of which one's the nerd. And yet they still have the doubts, the things that you know, made it less than, than simple to belong to a church. But to point it out as this horrible conflict or that there's a magic pill that we could all take. Um, what it is is honest searching and the honest statement, I don't know. I'll end with, with one story. Uh, there's a guy in my field. <clears throat> um, who was a meteorite scientist and hard-nosed and the kind of guy who, if you made a mistake, he'd let you know about it right away. He was at the University of Chicago for many years. And I showed up there studying in Chicago because I was studying to be a Jesuit, studying philosophy. But I was also taking a class at University of Chicago, so I figured I'd wander by. And he, we walked in, we were chatting a whole lot. And I said, well, what brings you to Chicago? Well, I'm studying to be a Jesuit. And I could feel the temperature in the room drop 20 degrees. Okay, this is what's happening. I, I was surprised because for three years that hadn't happened. 
And what really happened was people who had known me all my life started asking me these incredibly deep questions. Like, you know, I've only been a Jesuit two months, they haven't told me that one yet. <laughs> but, but in this case, you could tell he was very, very nervous. And then, so as I'm making my gradual withdrawal, he goes, wait a minute, were you always Catholic? And I'm going, Italian dad, Irish mom, yeah. <laughs> and suddenly he's really happy again and really friendly. And he ends by inviting me to his synagogue to give a talk. And it wasn't that he was mad at me for being religious. He thought I was Jewish. And that I had left my faith to become a, Jew, uh, a Jesuit. And when he realized that wasn't the case, that's fine, that's great. So, I think the answer in all these cases, and other people come up and, and you know, people who have done, dealt with this in your own place, I suspect. Um, you, you continue to love the people. You continue to listen to your kids, to your friends, and you trust the Holy Spirit, who's stronger than anybody making a movie about what they're like and why we all need to be alarmed, which I don't find always all that useful. Anyone else want to? Brother James, come on up. This answer isn't part of my presentation, but it kind of bleeds into my, one, of, one of my two presentations tomorrow. So, um, specifically about the expelled video that you mentioned, I think I'll cast that in um, just so you'll follow James Krasinski. I'm going to present tomorrow. I was a Catholic priest high school teacher for seven years from 2005 to 2012. And I always joke that after I got ordained, the bishop wanted to send me back to high school. Um, <laughs> and then the joke continued because then he sent me to college ministry for six years. I was a super duper senior, I guess you could say, <laughs> on the six year plan. Um, when I started high school ministry, the movie you mentioned was all the rage. And kids, parents would be like, Father, we have to have this at Regis, Regis High School, Eau Claire. Not Jesuit, diocesan, long story how that happened. Um, and it was always this presumption of, well, this is the science that accepts God versus the other science that doesn't accept God. Now, I am not a scientist, as many of you, I am, I'm kind of like the other side of, Brenda, she, and she did an excellent job, by the way, talking about faith as someone who, do, who claims that she's not. <laughs> I am not a scientist, um, and the only reason there's STL, for those of you who know what that degree is, you're like, oh, this guy's arrogant. No, I do that specifically to let you know, I'm not a PhD in astrophysics, I'm a priest. I'm more of a theologian, I'm, that's more my thing. I love science, and I would have parents similar to the movie, just violently saying, get rid of evolution, get rid of biology, get rid of our current curriculum, we need to integrate intelligent design. I said no. Um, why did I say no? Because I watched the video and I could see there was a lot of inaccuracies from beginning to end on a lot of things in that movie. I don't want my students to learn something that isn't true. <laughs> um, and even though I wasn't a scientist, there was something intuitively about it that, like, it, to me, it, at the risk of sounding like a typical central, or central Wisconsin kid, it didn't pass the sniff test to me either. There was just something that just, that just didn't hit right. Well, I was called, uh, you're a bad priest, and you know, you're losing your faith, and, how dare you say that there's room for evolution? Well, I had uh, three students who were proud to say to me, Father, we're going to show you science the way it's supposed to be. We're going to be intelligent design. All three of them are now atheists because as they got into the hard sciences, they started to realize that what they were told and trusted, and I'm not saying it's bad people that put them, they were very sincere people, that what they learned through that movie was wrong. 
And because being that that movie feeds into the God of the Gaps problem that Newton developed of finding God only in the spaces where of the things you can't explain, once they started to learn that, oh wait, some of the things that that movie purports we can explain scientifically, it fed the myth that if you can explain it, that's obviously not God. If you can't explain it, then that's where God is. And so therefore their gap for their faith shrunk, 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 shrunk in their college studies. Now, quantum leap, quantum leap. I always, quantum leap is one of the dumbest, it's the smallest leap of, of all, of all things. I just, it's like saying easy as pie. I've never found making pie easy, you know, I'm just like, um, now, one, I hardly ever hear people saying things like, Father, we need to have intelligent design. It seems like that that was a phase that's dying out. Ironically, I heard this argument come up again. A dear friend of mine, Dr. Ann Garrity, a molecular biologist, um, whose job certain parents wanted to see disappear, <laughs> Um, called me and said, Father, I'm having an argument with my brother. And I'm like, okay, what's up? It's intelligent design. Okay, it's been a while. So state the argument. I learned from that conversation now, intelligent design is morphed. Because originally, because I said, oh, so they reject evolution. Oh, no, no, they accept evolution. Okay. That's new. Um, so, and as we went through it, it's like there's a move in those, what I would call philosophical circles, not scientific circles of intelligent design, that are starting to realize the errors of things like that movie and that they were wrong on certain things. It's still out there, but it's drastically different now and much more accepting and it's much more of the idea of science shouldn't be saying there can't be a god now if that's what intelligent design becomes and all the rest of normal science is accepted i'll stand behind that 100 percent because when you look at the nature of science that's the whole point science remains neutral on questions of god and things that are you know in terms of the transcendent and and there is never going to be a metaphysics of science. <laughs> That's not what science can do. I think what intelligent design gets confused with is when they hear media scientists say things like, because of my science, God can't exist. That's not a scientific statement. That's some dude in front of a camera's personal opinion. <laughs> now, can they make it sound really convincing based on the, you know, sorry, I can't, for lack of a better term, the information vomit they throw on you in terms of like, wow, this guy's super smart, so he must be right when he says there is no God. I know some very super smart people that are way smarter than I that are dead wrong about a lot of things. Um, I think of my brother Brian as one of them. <laughs> 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 That boy is like 50 times more intelligent me, than me, but something went wrong. The common sense stop of the train never, never stopped in my brother's life. Um, and he, we've all walked with him through that, and we still love him, you know. Um, but I, I think from that standpoint that I think one of the things that we as people of, of faith and science need to do to go back to your initial point of how do we keep our kids from losing their faith. A, don't panic. <laughs> I want to be a professional scientist. Oh my gosh, you're going to become an atheist. Because <laughs> as any parent of teenagers know, once you say don't date the boy, that's the boy they want to date. <laughs> and then, and then, don't be an atheist. Oh, what's that all about? I, I'm gonna, I better pick up some books on this if mom and dad think where I'm going nuts. <laughs> um, love them where they're at. You know, share the faith and sincerity. 
and encourage them to pursue truth. If there's one thing I've learned for having the privilege of being asked by Brother Guy to walk with um, Vatican Observatory, both with the, uh, you know, Astronomy for Catholics and Ministry and Education, Faith and Astronomy, Acme Fall, and writing for the blog is how many times I've been like, oops, <laughs> I'm wrong there. <laughs> I was wrong there. And I think that that's one of the gifts from this. One of the things that I, I think is dangerous about the intelligent design movement of the past, present it's getting different. And it's not about intelligent design, it's I'm right, you're wrong, and if you think differently than me, you should get fired and you're a horrible priest. Of course, we live at a time where, I mean, if you don't take a side, what's fun in that? Because then you can't try to kill each other. I mean, that's just kind of sadly the culture we live in. Um, but to me, I would caution against thinking that that movie is where things should go because the intelligent design people themselves are realizing, you know what, we kind of messed up with that. Um, what's the answer? Pursuing truth. <laughs> Pursuing an honest investigation, having the humility of, you know what, maybe we're wrong. I think one of the, one time I walked into, I didn't realize I walked into this, but I walked into a presentation one time, I was asked to talk at a Protestant church, which will remain nameless because I don't want to sound. I just kind of presumed there was an open scientist. It became very quick, very clear, very quick, very fast. It was a group of Catholics that wanted nothing to do <laughs> with the idea of, of evolution. And then when I flashed in my presentation, the quote from Benedict the 16th when he was um, with a group of German clergy and the question was asked about, um, you know, what are your thoughts as Pope on evolution? He said, look, there's so much evidence for it, it's kind of ridiculous not to accept it. And it kind of, <sighs> that's Pope Bank the 16th, God's Rottweiler, super conservative dude that is completely misunderstand historically. <laughs> um, um, be careful about thinking that one answer is gonna lead us through. Um, one answer will lead us through. Um, God. God will lead us through. The God of the Torah, of which I accept, um, and God's revelation, John Paul II, faith and reason, pursuing the truth. Um, we have to regain as a people and I'm not just saying this religiously, but as an American society, we have to regain the idea that we all get things right, but we also get a lot of things dead wrong. Because whether it's in our political arena, our social spheres, our religious spheres, the, it seems like the only unforgivable sin is to say two things. I was wrong. And I'm sorry. It seems like those in our culture are the only two unforgivable sins in a secular sense. Time to get away from that. <laughs> what is. I think what Ben's time was trying to do with that movie was to show the intolerance mm -hmm. of many in the academy to any alternative. To what they were proposing. Precisely what you're talking about. Yeah. Right. And I would say that, and I think that the way that that movie is presented, you give a very fair explanation of how that, I think that what that movie didn't do was to show that one of the reasons that the Academy resisted so hard wasn't presented well enough in that movie, and that's because it was laced with errors. And it becomes a very different, dangerous thing that accept this school of thought because of our ideology. We've made some very hist dangerous historical mistakes. Not just with science, but just, just, ex I know I'm lying to you, but just go along with me. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, 
that's kind of a direct violation of my promise of obedience to the bishop that I made and the ordination that Christ is the way, the truth, and life. It's not Christ is the way, the sometimes truthful in the life. No, it's, it, it's, we need to be careful about saying, well, yeah, we know there's problem, but boy, doesn't it show how horrible things are. Well, maybe there's something behind why it was wrong that can explain why, the, why it's so horrible. It's not because of mean atheists trying to overtake peace-loving Christians. It might be, you got some things wrong. Let's talk about it. No, he didn't. Yeah, it's not a good starting point. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say that again, Richard Dawkins is a primary case. Is Dawkins a brilliant scientist? Absolutely. Um, his science is quite brilliant. His religious statements are his opinions. When he goes after Christianity and says kind of creates his Christian straw horses that he can try to burn in front of people that, as a theologian, I'm like, uh, no, that's not how theology works. <laughs> um, excuse me, Mr. Dawkins. But uh, there's one thing, though, with Dawkins. I'm not a fan of Dawkins, for obvious reasons. Um, there's one thing, though, that Dawkins said that when he was... It's, a, it's an incredible, I'd be very curious to get your, from a Jewish perspective on Rabbi Sachs, you know, and, and your opinion of him. There is a, a BBC documentary of, you know, rest in peace, Rabbi Sachs, and talking with different atheists at the intellectual elite capitals of England. And it ends with Dawkins. I was stunned when Rabbi Sachs um, got... Uh, Dawkins to admit two things. He said, well, for, well, three things actually, because Sachs said, now one thing, Richard, that I find difficult is that you say you're an atheist. I don't think you're an atheist. I think you're a Christian atheist, but I don't hear anything in you that says you're a Jewish atheist. And it was a discussion on, it was basically Sachs kind of intellectually tweaking the nose of, I know the game. <laughs> I know that you're you're zeroing in on somebody, and this isn't some purist intellectual. You're just going after Christians. And he admitted it. <laughs> Dawkins admitted it. Point two, Dawkins admitted, when Rabbi Sachs said, now you're talking to me about, you know, bad religion, and the examples you give is good examples of bad religion, but I can give you examples of bad science. So, for you as a scientist, is the answer to bad science no science, or is the answer to bad science good science? The answer, Dawkins says, is, well, the answer to bad science is good science. Well, then why would you then say that the answer to bad religion is no religion, and why not to say the answer to bad religion is good religion? Dawkins said, to my shock, <laughs> you've got a point. <laughs> The most important one. Now, one thing we can completely agree on, and I'm thank you, you said it, Richard, this is me talking as Rabbi Sachs, is that you have made the comment that you, even though you believe in natural selection, you do not believe in natural selection as a social theory. Um, and you said you're absolutely right. If we believe that natural selection should be turned into a political entity, we revive Hitler. We revive only the strong survive. And in no way do I want my understanding of natural selection to become a political ideology. And the question that Dawkins would not answer, I'm like, come on, that Rabbi Sachs beautifully followed up with, that he stayed mute on, then what should govern our social and political decisions? If you're, si if you're admitting that your science isn't enough, <laughs> which science itself would say, don't turn what we do into a political philosophy. I mean, I, among the professional scientists here, I hope I'm well within <laughs> the end of my... Um, he didn't answer it. He wouldn't. Because I knew that it was... Uh, and I would encourage, I can't remember the name of it, but if he just wrote, wrote you know, Rabbi Sachs, 
Dawkins, BBC, it'll probably pop up. It's excellent. I think that something like that that can unmask that be careful about, and, and no, truth be told, um, in my workings with college kids, most of the kids don't know who Dawkins is anymore. <laughs> that was a, again, that was, he was hot when I was, in, when I was doing high school ministry, 2005 to 2012. I hardly ever hear kids, even adults, talk about Dawkins. It, again, that kind of seems like a fad that's slowly dying out. Um, <laughs> maybe not, I don't know. I, um, <laughs> um, but uh, to me, I think that things like that, that I am glad that Dawkins said he doesn't want natural selection to become a political theory. But then Dawkins, come on, <laughs> what was your answer that you wouldn't give? And I think that those moments when he can show, hey, look, there is a game here being played by him that has nothing to do with the science. Um, he's aggressively going after Christians. And if we say, well, we have to dissect his book and show all of his examples of faith wrong, you're going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> That's what he wants you to do. <laughs> Um, pursue truth. Pursue truth. And let the Dawkins stuff just, if there's one thing I've learned as a priest, truth lives, lies die. <laughs> pursue the truth. The lies that the Dawkins of the world try to say about religion, they're going to die. They always have, always will. But it's really tough in that moment when Especially when it's, Father, my, my daughters become atheists and it's because of science. <laughs> Boy, that's loaded on many levels. Well, how has her faith life been? Well, I've been trying to get her from church since she was six years old, and she, but we drug her to church. I mean, sometimes just... <laughs> and it's science that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Let's look at some other dynamics too, <laughs> you know. And that's why I think that we love finding scapegoats. Um, let's find truth. Do I, can I respect where you're coming from? Absolutely, because it is a very, when I first saw it as a priest, I was like, dang. But then as a, the more I watched, I'm like, yeah. I watched a third time, oh. I start to read the sources under it, and I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, sorry for running on like that. Um, expelled specifically, no, because to be quite frank, it's kind of been off the radar for quite some time. Um, I'd have to kind of look into, I would, but my only concern would be that being that it's kind of been, it, this is the first time I've heard about that documentary probably in about 10 years. Um, uh, but it was all the rage when I was a high school teacher. Uh, the clarifications would be dated, so, but I could definitely look into that to see if I can find some resources for you. But. All right, I better shut up because otherwise I'll have no reason to talk tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the two of us, as the professional scientists, can say that we never, I've never heard anyone tell me I can't do the science I'm doing because of my faith. That just has never come up. Um, in fact, at, I, you know, members of the Vatican Observatory are prominent members of international organizations like the American Astronomical Society, like the IAU, in part because we're not competing with anybody for funding, <laughs> which, let's face it, that's what the real religion is. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> I, at where science is actually happening, there is not that kind of uh, effort happening. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I have to agree. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for bringing it back. Uh, it to be very eloquently put uh, by Brother Guy and, and Father Krasinski as well. Um, I've not found any obstacle, and I've not heard of any obstacle to the science that I do being problematic in any way. 
um, you know, with the Jewish faith or not finding any obstacle with, you know, being, you know, having faith and, and being and being a scientist. Um, it is quite, it is a little more subtle. I think we're not yelling it from the mountaintops perhaps as much as that 1% of, of people who, who go the other direction. But I really like Brother Guy's comment, if I could end with that, on just kind of being patient. And it follows on with Father Kaczynski's idea, too, that maybe in the end the, the lies go away and, and the truth persists. This is a much longer game than just five years or ten years. You know, both of our faiths span centuries and millennia. You have to have faith and keep going. <laughs>